This is Genesis Bri Piorich, and we are on Nardvar's Human Serviette Program, somewhere in Canada, somewhere very secret. Nardvar! Who are you? Yes, hello. Yes, hello. You are Genesis? Uh, that's true. You want to know who we are? Yeah, Genesis Bri Piorage of Psychic TV and many other projects. And Jen, who do you have beside you? Um, mm, good question, really. <laughs> it's Edley O'Dowd. That's Edley O'Dowd. That's me. Welcome to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Thank you. Right off the bat, Genesis, I have a gift for you. Brian, come back. You are forgiven. Bastard. Don't call me a bastard. No, that's what that seven inch is. Is that right? Yes, Brian Jones, your idol. I would never call him a bastard because he was legitimate. Uh, you actually met him because your dad cleaned ABC Studios? That's, that's true, yes. Uh, I also met his two bastards, Julian and Julian. Julian to Pat Andrews and Julian to Linda, who married Donovan. I met both of those sons and they were bastards. And, as well, you have his jacket, too. You do talk weird, don't you? Is that, is that part of the, the shtick? Well, you have his jacket. I'm shouting at people. What's <laughs> um, well, Genesis? I mean... What is it? Aardvark? Nardwar. Nardwar. Nardwar, the human serviette. Yeah, okay. Um, actually, we were just reading something today online about Brian Jones. There's a new book just come out, and... We've had this theory for a while. You, you're aware that Brian Jones, John Lennon, and Jimi Hendrix were about to form a group together. And they made several demo tapes at Olympic Studios, of which we have some, some copies. And we always knew that Brian Jones was murdered. We figured that out a long, long time ago. And it was, it was too suspicious. He was found in the pool, supposedly drowned through using drugs and not and having an asthma attack, but that's just not the case. We, we met the people who did the autopsy, and they said there wasn't water in his lungs, so he didn't drown. Um, why did the people at the house phone the Rolling Stones publicist before they called an ambulance or the police and waited for him to drive from London to this village and go through the house, and what did he do when he went through the house? He got every single tape recording he could find and all the stage costumes and burned them in a bonfire. Then they called the police. And then you got your recordings? How did you get the Brian Jones recordings? The same way we got the jacket and se several other things, people would come to concerts when we did the song God Star back in 85, and they would say, for example, the person with the jacket said, I used to be a, a roadie for the Rolling Stones and in the 60s, and when they moved into just wearing casual clothing and not trying to be like the Beatles, because at the beginning, Andrew Oldham had them wearing grey herringbone jackets. Um, he gave his jacket to this roadie who gave it to me 30 years later or something like that. And we have a gift here for Edley, a Kenneth Anger LP. Wow, thank you very much. Oh, what can you say about Kenneth Anger and your association with him? You love his movies. Yes, yes, one of the great filmmakers of the 20th century. Derek Jarman, Kenneth Anger, those are the two really important ones. And Fellini. So that is for you, Ellie. Thank you very much. Before it happens. This is time travel. You're aware of that. I am indeed, Genesis, and I was really confused by this. What is going on here exactly? Force it. UFO. Well, that's, a, that's the name of a, 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 a sort of early heavy metal type band. UFO, and a picture is myself and Cozy Fanny Tutti. And as it's called Fawcett, which in United States in language means bathroom, not a toilet, a bathroom, hence the set, they thought it would be funny if we were forcing it in some kind of sexual innuendo. And they wanted ambiguous uh, people. They wanted it to look like it could be two women, it could be whatever. Ambiguous gender. Even then, way, way back, 76. 
So how did you hook up with UFO in 75? And this is the German issue. Is it? Oh, right. Well, uh, Sleazy, Peter Christofferson, who was in TG, Throbbing Gristle, also was a partner in Hypnosis, and they were commissioned to do this cover. And he said he didn't know many people who didn't mind getting naked on camera, but he knew we wouldn't mind. So he said, do you want to get paid to get naked in a bathroom? And we said, yes. And that's how it happened. Tell him how cold it was. Oh, it was fucking freezing. It was so cold. It was in the winter in London in a house that was derelict, and they built this set in the house. There was no heat, no hot water, so it was cold water they were spraying over us. It doesn't even show in the picture. It was miserable. What a long day. And Genesis Sleazy took promo pics of the Sex Pistols that Marco McLaren called shocking, too shocking? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He took photos of the Sex Pistols and it was too shocking. Aardvark. Nardwar, the human, survey et. Et tu, Brutus. Acme Attractions got you into punk? Acme Attractions? We've never been into punk. It's too traditional. Well, that exposed you to punk, Acme Attractions. No, it didn't. No, sorry. You're wrong. Myself and Sleazy were commissioned to redesign Acme Attractions, and we called it Boy. And to this day, Boy, the brand is still going. We got paid £60 to design the shop, come up with the, lo the logo and the name and the brand and everything. But my, the person who exposed me to punk was Sue Catwoman. She was your girlfriend, right? Yeah, for three years officially and a couple more after that. And uh, an amazing woman. She knew everybody. She knew everybody and she'd take me around to all the pubs and we'd see the damned and we saw the jam when they'd not made any records, all of them before that, Eater, everyone. It was a pretty interesting time. Did you audition Billy Idol? <laughs> yes. Yes, you, yes, we did. Oh, it's a, what a terrible thing we've done. Genesis is responsible for Billy Idol? Yes, at that time. My friend at university was trying to have a band. The guy who had Acme Attractions that we changed it to boy, John Cravine, he wanted to have a band to rival the Sex Pistols. He goes, Malcolm has the Sex Pistols, so I want a band for my shop. And I'm going to call it Chelsea. Could you audition people to be in my band? So that's what we did. We went down to a warehouse where he stored old jukeboxes and various young guys came up playing and one of them got up and said, I'm Bill Broad and I want to pay, play rhythm guitar. And we turned to John and said, he's a natural, pick him. And so we picked out the band, which then became Generation X. And in their first official biography, they credit me with having pulled them together. Genesis, you liked the nipple erectors more than crass? Yes, yes, this is true. Well, wouldn't you? I mean, crass means boring and stupid, and nipple erectors means exciting and sensual. Aardvark, pit, pit viper. Genesis, did you make a minefield? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you mean a real minefield that exploded? Yes, yes, we did, yeah. Way back in the 70s with Coombe Transmissions at the Bradford Arts Festival in a field. Nobody thought it was real. We got all this barbed wire and we put a fence of barbed wire around it, but I'd made all these homemade bombs. Um, it was in the days when you could still buy the ingredients legally before all the IRA thing. And I'd found out how to mix fertilizer and sugar and things and make explosions. And so it said, danger, minefield, do not enter, etc. And, of course, people just can't resist. And they think, oh, it can't be a minefield. Surely not. So people would climb in, and then they would trip these wires, and off would go these big, huge flashbangs around them. It was fun. Psychic TV, quote, <laughs> I'm looking for you. And I was really curious. You have that song, I'm looking for you. What can you say about Anton LaVey? There's a connection. He played on one of your records. Joy, Psychic TV. Well, he didn't play. He's on it. We sampled him. <laughs> but we did reproduce his uh, Satanic Mass. He gave me the old tapes, and we took it in a studio and cleaned it up so it could be re-released as a CD. And uh, he's an interesting man. Fun. Very funny. The Doctor. Dr. LeVay. He did play keyboards. Did you think about getting him to play keyboards? 
You ever heard him play fucking keyboards? Well, on this record, he does an okay job. It was it was torment. That was what we all dreaded when we went to the Black House. It was like about 11 o'clock at night. He'd get a little bit tipsy and happy, and he'd suddenly say, let's go in the kitchen. And he'd be like, oh, no, that's where his keyboards are. And about 20 cats. <laughs> and then he would sit down, and there'd be this stink of cat piss, and he would start playing bombastic music. He had this thing that the next music after industrial and punk would be bombastic and he was ahead of the curve with his bombastic keyboards. I mean, it was sweet for about a half hour, but after four hours, it started to get really difficult to put up with it. I have another gift for you, Genesis. A laser disc, Poetry in Motion, and it features William Burroughs, who you met through a Canadian magazine. Is that true? Through a Canadian magazine, you met William Burroughs? In a sort of meandering way, yes, in a meandering way. So anyway, we got this magazine file, and in it was uh, something called the Image Bank Request List, which was based in Vancouver. How about that? The Image Bank. The Canadian Connection. Yes, and the place was a sort of art centre, an ad hoc independent art centre called Western Front. And they also were friends with General Idea, who were another ad hoc group of artists in Toronto. And... Uh, General Idea did File magazine, which was a sort of pastiche of life. And then the Western Front did the Image Bank request list, where you wrote your name, your address, and anything you wanted people to send you that you needed for projects. And so, for example, Anna Banana, who is Canadian, wanted anything to do with bananas. What a surprise. And William Burroughs put Camouflage for 1984. And we thought, hey, that's a really smart thing to put because it was in 72 or something. Seemed a long way off then, 84. But also, we thought, surely he hasn't put his real address. Why would he put his real address? But we thought, well, maybe, you never know. So we wrote to him. And he wrote back and said, whenever you're in London, come and see me. Get in a taxi, I'll pay for it. Thank you, the Western Front in Vancouver, for getting together. Burroughs and me. Me. No, I was curious. Edley, what did you invent with the Toilet Boys? Oh, your turn now. <laughs> um, the New York Dolls Meet the Runaways. I was fascinated by the Toilet Boys. Miss Guy... Did she, he, date Tracy Lords? No, that's not true. Sean Pierce, who's next to Miss Guy, we were all on our first trip to L.A., trying to make the scene there, and we went to a gay club where Sean, who's not gay at all, met Tracy Lords. And who's not gay at all. Who's not gay at all. And we proceeded to have kind of a party with her, but I do believe that Sean and Tracy went off and slept elsewhere that evening. What have you told Genesis about the Toilet Boys? Genesis has actually seen the Toilet Boys. Yeah. I, we threw sweets at you once, didn't we? <laughs> that was a good story. <laughs> they weren't sweets. <laughs> they were... Um, Tampons? No, they were pharmaceutical. Pills. Yes. Well, they were yes. pills. Yeah. Sweet. What was this? Yeah, this was at, uh, there was an opening of a hair salon at a sort of she-she shopping place in, where is that, Chelsea? Manhattan, yeah. yeah somewhere. And um, they asked the Toilet Boys to perform a short set. Um, so Genesis and Lady J came, stood in the front row, and they were pelting Miss Guy with pharmaceutical pills. <laughs> And until she be, until she became visibly annoyed, which was kind of hilarious. But <laughs> I don't even know why we did that. Something got us in the mood, but I don't know what it was. Guy said to me after the fact, you know, was, what, Jen and Jackie, like, what, what was that about? <laughs> did you spit on John Peel? Yes, yes, we did do that. <laughs> he wrote about that. Yeah, the first time we met him, yeah. That was long before punk, too. That was 72, 71. John Peel came into Hull in Yorkshire, where we were at the time. And we thought, how do we get him to talk to us without just saying, we like what you do? 
So we went up and said, we really like what you do, and we spat on him. <laughs> and said, don't worry, that's the way we show our love. I didn't know that. Yes. I did not know that story. <laughs> so he nicknamed us Goz Rock, because <laughs> Goz means spit in England. I would like to ask you about another Canadian band from Vancouver, Skinny Puppy. What can you say about Skinny Puppy, Puppy Gristle? Oh, you've done your research. Well, we're friends with Ogre and Kevin, so that's the connection. We both met through a band called Pig Face, which was touted as an industrial supergroup in the 80s. No, the 90s. 90s, gosh, so long ago. That's how we met Ogre, and we got on really well straight away. We both love dogs, and we're both quiet and shy and retiring. And so we were the two that were sitting and talking about philosophy in the band. Well, the rest of the band were taking drugs and having sex with groupies. We'd be just discussing philosophy and animal rights. Ian Curtis of Joy Division. Here we go. <laughs> he talked you out of suicide. Ian Curtis talked you out of suicide. No, no, no. No, and that's not true. I don't know where you got that one from. He was the, he, I was the last person he spoke to before he died. But he did have my song about trying to commit suicide memorized. And in that last phone call, he sang it to me word perfect. And we thought, he's going to try and kill himself. And so we, this is the day before cell phones, before most people even had answer machines in Britain. So we started ringing anyone we could think of in Manchester saying, you've got to get round to Ian's house. He's going to try and kill himself. And the ones we got through to went, yeah, he's just being dramatic. We said, no, we think he's really going to try and do it. No one would go and check, and that's why we're still angry at certain people. Did Sleazy's parents really know the Queen? Yes, they were good friends. Lord and Lady Derman Christofferson were such good friends of the Queen that they would go there for tea and dinner and hang out and chat over dinner, and just like any other couple that with friends. That always made me a little worried, a bit concerned. But it did confirm that she knew who we were and she did not like me. So you actually came up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. They were sitting there and the Queen turned to Sleazy's mother and said, So, what's Peter doing these days? And she said, Oh, he's working with this artist called Genesis Peorage. And the Queen apparently sort of went backwards slightly and went, Oh, Oh dear, oh. And then she turned to the head of MI5 and said, we know all about this person, don't we? And then he told them, you should get your son away from this person, Genesis. He's a very bad influence, he's trouble. Get him away. But it just made Sleazy want to be nearer. Were your kids mad, Genesis, that you got breasts instead of a car? <laughs> Where does he get this stuff? That, that's, that's not even, like, in, ever been in an interview. <laughs> it, might, it might have. It might have. That was the, my younger daughter, Jeunesse. She's 31. And we, we, we thought we should ring them up and say, you know, Papa's got breasts because someone would be bound to tell them. And all she said was, are you serious? And we thought, oh, she doesn't like this. You got breasts when you could have spent that money on getting me a new car? She was outraged that we wasted money when we could have given it to her. But she got over it within minutes. But otherwise, they weren't bothered at all. Didn't care. How much money would it take to look like you, Genesis? <laughs> 66 years of stress. <laughs> like, for instance, Edley. What would it take for Edley to look like you? Oh, about 300,000. Did you, Genesis, tell Zodiac Mind Warp to get a cock ring? Yes. <laughs> I told a lot of people to do that. <laughs> yeah, you've got good memory. Why should people care about psychic TV? Why should people care? Um, why should they care about psychic TV? Well, hopefully they care about what we say. And that's more important, always. And what we stand for, what we represent, and that's what's been happening. We're selling out nearly everywhere we play now. And that's all over the world. I mean, to think that there are enough people in every country we get invited to, to fill venues, P 
people who come and they know about us and they've read the psychic bible and they've read things that we've said and they've even probably watched your strange thing um because we don't know what to call it they 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 believe that we're the few one of the few lots of people who are telling them an authentic truth that we don't sugarcoat things we tell them what we really feel is happening at any given moment and that's rare most people are trying to succeed we're not we're trying to talk to everyone and make their lives a little better and the idea of change a little easier. Well, thanks very much, Psychic TV. Keep on rocking in the free world and do do loo do 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 Pit Viper. Oh, is this what happens at the end? I guess this is the the important bit of mime. <laughs>